Who is Malik ibn Dinar? Malik ibn Dinar is a tabi'i. He was born in the era of the Sahaba and he studied under some of the Sahaba. It is said that maybe even he saw Ibn Abbas as a child, but he studied with Anas ibn Malik. After the death of Al Hassan al Basri, the famous scholar of Basra, Malik ibn Dinar became the main icon of religiosity, of zuhd, of asceticism. And he was known for not only ilm, but primarily for ibadah, for worship. He was an icon of the city in terms of his lifestyle, very simple, very frugal, in terms of constant worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always being in the masjid. Anybody wanted to see him, he would go to the masjid, find him there. He once famously remarked, had it not been for the fact that I have to break my wudu and do wudu outside. I would be sitting here day and night. He would want to stay in the masjid. And there are many beautiful anecdotes about him. Once it is narrated that a thief came and uh, broke into the house of Malik ibn Dinar and he was in the corner doing dhikr and the thief did not notice. And he scoured the house. He couldn't find anything to steal. So then Malik saw it and said to him, you didn't find anything of this dunya. Can I gift you something better? So the thief became shocked and he became embarrassed. What is it? He said, do wudu and stand with me in tahajjud. So the thief felt so shy. He did wudu, prayed tahajjud. The adhan of fajr was called and Malik ibn Dinar went to pray fajr with the thief. Somebody was shocked that he saw him. Who is this guest? You never have any guests. Malik ibn Dinar said, this was a person who came to steal something from us, but we ended up stealing from him, meaning his bad akhlaq. We stole it from him and now we are going to Salat al-Fajr. Malik ibn Dinar as well, he was a person who earned his livelihood by writing the Quran. In those days, the Quran had to be written down and then tell the Quran the copy that he had written and he would then live off of that. It would take him four months to write one mushaf. And then as soon as somebody purchased the mushaf, he would take that money and he would immediately go to the grocery store, not even take it home and leave it as a deposit so that he could just purchase food and he didn't have to touch money. So the grocery store had a credit with him. Pause here footnote. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the subject or the profession that has the most right that you pay for it is the Quran. Hadith is in Bukhari. And some people think, how can I pay for the Quran? You're paying for the Quran teacher or you're paying for somebody writing the Quran. Our Prophet Sallallahu said, if you're going to pay something for anything, the most blessed thing to pay for is the Quran. By this hadith, our scholars derived that the Prophet opened the door for getting a payment for that which might be religion. You keep your niyyah sincere for the sake of Allah. So Malik ibn Dinar would earn his livelihood by writing the Quran. He considered this to be the most noble livelihood. And as I said, he would not even keep the money at home. The thief would come. There's nothing there. Once the Umayyads appointed a governor or Basra, he was from Basra, right? And the governor walked in with fine garments, boasting his chest puffed out, walking like this through the streets. And Malik ibn Dinar saw him and said, do you not fear Allah? This type of boastful walking is not allowed in Islam unless you are on the battlefield and you have to show the enemy. In that case, yes, you walk like that. Otherwise, you do not puff your chest and walk like this. So this Umayyad prince became insulted. He said, do you not know who I am? And Malik ibn Dinar said, yes, wallahi, I know who you are. You are a creature who was created from a fluid that is despicable even to mention. And your end result is going to be a corpse that is so stenchful, nobody will want to smell it or see it. And in the middle, you are a sack carrying your own defecation. That's who you are. Your beginning is something embarrassing to talk about. Your end is disgusting. Nobody wants to see it. And in the middle, you are carrying your own what you're going to go to the toilet. In other words, when somebody tried to be arrogant by his wealth, by his prestige and pride, Malik put him in his place like, who do you think you are? We are all Banu Adam. We are all created beings. Now, there are many interesting stories and many beautiful things about Malik ibn Dinar. But the main key point I wanted to bring up is that Malik ibn Dinar was not like this for his whole life. No, he actually had a very non-religious beginning. He was a member of the paramilitary elite of the government. You would call them the secret service. So when the government didn't like somebody, they would send the secret service to arrest, rough them up, maybe even kill them. And these are considered and they are still considered the worst of the worst. They have sold their deen and dunya for the sake of money. This is the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low. And he would drink and Allah blessed him with a child, a daughter. And he loved this daughter immensely. The daughter passed away at the age of two. The death of the daughter triggered him into depression and drinking more. That's what usually happens when you don't have iman, right? And one night he was drinking 
drinking and he fell asleep and he didn't even pray Isha. Back then, even the drunkards prayed a little bit. Yeah, there was different hero back then, right? And he went to sleep. He had a dream that night. In the dream, he saw that he was in front of a massive furnace and the furnace became hotter and hotter and the fire became unbearable. So he turned around and he began to flee. But wherever he ran, the furnace was right behind him. Then he saw a man in the dream, very beautiful, handsome, very impeccable clothes. And he thought, this man can save me. So he said to the man, oh man, you seem like Rajul Saleh, a good man. Save me from this furnace. The man said, I am too weak. I cannot save you. And in the dream, then he's going and he sees his two-year-old daughter. And the daughter recites to him a verse of the Quran. Alam amanu an Hasn't the time come for the people of Iman that their hearts soften towards the remembrance of Allah? And he said, Ya binti, you know the Quran? She said, yes, we know it in this world better than you. My daughter, explain to me what is happening what is this fire? What is this man? So the daughter says, that fire, it is your sins and it is going to engulf you. That good man, it is the small amount of good deeds you've done which is not strong enough yet to save you from your own fire. Your good deeds, they are too weak to save you from this fire. So he woke up and right then and there, he broke all of the bottles of wine in his house and he turned over and you leave. He quit this evil profession he was in and this was the flip that happened to him that he turned over completely, dedicated the rest of his life to ibadah and zuhd and taqwa and spreading ilm. He has a number of hadith as well in the famous six books. Even Al-Bukhari mentions his name in his famous Sahih and this shows us so many things and of the most beautiful lessons that Allah Azza wa Jal judges people by their ending not their beginning and we should not lose hope even if we might be at a phase of our lives where we're not living our best doesn't matter how we are today as long as we're aiming to be better tomorrow and we put in the effort so this is a person who grew up as a young man a drunkard grew up doing the worst profession possible and then subhanallah a flip happened and it also shows us that sometimes in fact, usually if we have Iman, a calamity is a blessing in disguise. It is used as a catalyst to bring about a blessing. And in fact, the loss of his daughter was eventually what triggered him to become a better Muslim and the most pious Muslim of in fact, you know, it is said of the city of Basra of his generation. He died in the year 127 Hijrah, so early on. It is said that towards the end of his life, you know, the conquest of Sindh had begun at that time, the conquest of India. So it is said that he was of the first people to go and start preaching Islam in India. And to this day, there is a small village in the southern coast of India. There is a masjid of Malik ibn Dinar. And the legends, the people firmly believe, the people will swear to you that this is the qabr of Malik ibn Dinar. And we find this mentioned in some of the books of the past that he was of the first batches of people to go and preach Islam in India. This is, by the way, the Kerala community in South India, right? And as we know, the entire southern coast are Muslim because of people like Malik ibn Dinar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resurrect us with the righteous of the past. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us righteous and to overcome our sins and to make our ibrah, our final days, the best days and our final deeds, the best deeds. And we ask Allah that we all die upon Tawheed and Ikhlas and the Kalima. 